Hey everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to look at Twist, number one through three, a late 80s anthology published by Kitchen Sink Comics. Um, this was the um, brainchild of uh, J.D. King, great cartoonist, um... I think he's still doing graphic design work now. And uh, it was uh, didn't have much of a budget. But with that low budget, they did the best they could. And there's some great shit in here. Lots of reprint material. Um, a lot of stuff that's in the public domain. They figure this out. But J.B. King had impeccable taste. And there's some great shit in this stuff. So uh, let's uh, look at the first issue here. Covered by J.D. King. Had this very stylized art. You can see on these two other co covers. He does all the covers. Um, very strange. But good. And um, it's advertised as the highbrow, lowbrow comics magazine. And uh, the very first uh, page, which is illustrated by Steve Fiorilla. He does all these nice, beautiful side panel arts is um, a twist tutorial by J.D. King. And uh, I kind of want to read a little of this because it gives you uh, the aesthetic behind this anthology because it definitely has an aesthetic. Hey there, sophisticated cats and sophisticated chicks. Welcome to the land of twist. It's a cool and comfy, crazy and cozy country where Goofy Grape is president and Loudmouth Lime the secretary of offense. Its borders are defined by Harvey Kurtzman and Jack Kerouac, Boris Karloff and Basil Wolverton, Chester Gould and the Chocolate Watch Band. The local theater is showing Glitter Glenda, double billed with Unchenna and Deluge. And Deluge, sorry. Sharing popcorn in the audience are Lovebirds William Bendix and Judy London. So it does have this kind of late 80s, uh, that whole cocktail swinger scene, you know? But um, it definitely lives up to its highbrow, lowbrow thing. And um, it's got some amazing stuff in here. And so here's the contents page. Right off the bat, we get a beautiful treasure. These are rarely seen Basil Wolverton drawings. Um, you know, obviously reprints. They were probably in some magazine, never reprinted since. But he got, um, sorry, uh, I forgot, Mort Todd, the great uh, editor and writer, to make these funny little rhyming things to go with them. And no matter what the drawings are, they somehow tied into a cowboy theme. Some of these were obviously not drawn. This has nothing to do with cowboys, but Mort Todd turns it into some cowboy theme thing. But here you go, just some great Basil Wolverton that you probably haven't seen. I didn't see this stuff until way later. I mean, I saw it when I bought these in the 80s, but, uh, you know, way later I got those Basil Wolverton collections. I was like, oh, okay, that's that stuff that I saw in Twist. So... I mean, the more Todd uh, little poems, little limericks aren't that great. They're not that funny. I mean, just getting to see all this beautiful Basil Wolverton shit. Look at that. Basil Wolverton. Well, he could do that. So then next we get uh, Dan Klaus. Back before Dan Klaus was like hot shit Dan Klaus. He was already uh, making a name for himself, but this is a point where he would still be in this low-budget anthology. And story by Mortad. Freddie Brown the Squirt in Shelter Skelter. And these are very, like, um, PG-rated Dan Klaus. Probably because of Mortad. They're funny. They're pretty good. It's early Dan Klaus, as you can see. kind of like this early Dan Klaus. Very, obviously, more... Bernard Krigstein slash Harvey Kurtzman influence than he became. But I kind of miss this Dan Klaus. I love Dan Klaus's shit. 
But I kind of wish he still drew like this sometimes. Because this is some really nice cartooning. And uh, basically Freddie Brown is just this typical like little shit kid who gets in all these shenanigans. He's got like a straight dad mom who put up with his stuff. They're usually the foils for his shenanigans. And they're the straight men. And uh, just look at that art. That's some really nice cartooning. Yeah, Dan Klaus doesn't draw like that. He hasn't drawn like that in 20 years. Look at that. That's some amazing stuff, though. But, um, yeah, it's just a fun little story about this. Almost like the Cats and Jammer kids, you know? He's just this little bastard making trouble for everyone. And here we go. Peter Bag also when. He would still contribute to little anthologies, you know, that didn't pay much. Geniuses. I like this one a lot. It's just like these six panels of these various people who are very pleased with themselves. Even though it sounds, you know, you can tell from their dialogue that they don't have much talent. They're not geniuses, but they think they are. You know, there's a computer guy whose computer game is you know, awesome, but he just doesn't have the software to complete it. But if he did, it would take over the industry. This woman with some stupid idea for marketing something and how she's brilliant at marketing. That's her talent. This rock guy in a rock band who's like, oh, people just don't get my shit. In five years from now, when I OD, they'll finally realize what a genius I was. It's that kind of stuff. Just great early Peter Bag. And uh, Peter Bag's really good at just like, you know, character study stuff. This is a Josh Gosfield. I haven't seen him many places except in Twist. He's in every issue of Twist. I think he might have been in um, some other anthologies back then. He looks familiar. And he just has these kind of silly strips, but they they got some good gags in them. And But they're kind of random, the humor. And as you can tell, it's not like he's a great artist. But it kind of works for his goofy little gags. It's a nice, cute little cartoony style. Fucking true Friedman. And uh, this comic has a lot of reprints and public domain stuff. I'm pretty sure this was somewhere else first. Like maybe in Heavy Metal. And then they were like, hey, we'll reprint this. Because, you know... A lot of people into this kind of comic wouldn't buy heavy metal. But this is a savage <laughs> thing about Jules Pfeiffer. They just make Jules Pfeiffer seem like a total douchebag nincompoop. And it's weird because apparently Drew Friedman knew Jules Pfeiffer as a little kid. His father knew him. He'd come over for dinner and stuff. And I think he respects Jules Pfeiffer, but you know how Drew Friedman sometimes he could be kind of mean-spirited in his little, uh, caricatures of people. So, I don't know. Maybe he really does hate Jules Pfeiffer, but this comic is brutal. It makes Jules Pfeiffer look like a nincompoop. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, Patrick McDonald, uh, the Mutz guy, the, that major syndicated strip. I think this might be right before he started that. And he just has this little kind of Nicely designed abstract comic, one page. This guy's just wandering around in this abstract page. And then he just says, I've seen it all. It's kind of, I, I don't know, I kind of like it. I don't know why. Here's, here's the lowbrow part. Stephen W. Blickenstaff just doing a very Basil Wolverton-like gnarly center spread. of Some weird monster dude. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, this is obviously kind of highbrow. Like, something that could be in the New Yorker. And then he's got this. That's why I like Twist. It was a... I wish it kept going past three issues. Every issue would have this, the Twist List, which is almost like the High Times thing, where people just send in random things that they like. So, you know, Blue Velvet, the movie. Um, Garbage Pail Kids. Jonathan Richmond. Whatever. And J.D. King illustrates them. Makes little cute drawings for a lot of them. 
Here's another nice Drew Friedman. Pretty sure I've seen this before. Maybe this was the first time, but I think they reprinted this. Drag Beulah, one of his little movie parodies. Here's a J.D. King, the editor. Uh, here's a one-pager. Um, just kind of a silly, goofy comic strip. Um, but it's got his nice, stylized, incredibly stylized art. Like, J.D. King could have worked for UPA Animation back in the 50s. I mean, he's that stylized. Very retro, kind of cool style. Here's another example of these guys, like, finding, getting these great artists to contribute, but not really. Uh, apparently, Robert Williams was commissioned to design graphics for some skateboards. The project was killed. So he had this art lying around. And uh, they hit him up and he said, here, you can print this stuff. So it's some really nice Robert Williams art, but, you know, it's just something that was lying around his house. Here we have this weird little one-page short story by Ron Colm. A little illustration by J.D. King. It's just like a, a story about this couple who are botting me out. It's, you know, whatever. It's It's not much. It's a page. But, um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting, pretty well written. It's just about this couple who are just, uh, they're on a downward spiral and getting poorer and poorer. So here we got, uh, um, John Holmstrom, the, the creator of Punk Magazine and a uh, great cartoonist. And his character, Bosco, that was like his Mickey Mouse. Uh, Bosco's Perfect Day. And I kind of like this strip because it's like... It's so sad that this is Bosco's perfect day. Like, like he wakes up, his favorite Tex Avery cartoon is on, or at least a Tex Avery cartoon is on. He's got some instant coffee left. Wow. That's great. And he's reading a, the Mother Goose in the newspaper that day is exceptionally funny. A really good one. Um, the Mets finally make it back to first. He's a sports fan, so he's happy. Uh, the crossword puzzle, he finishes it for the first time in a while, and he's very happy. This uh, hot new girl moves into his apartment and invites him over to a party. Um, he, His new weekly world news shows up. He's very happy. <laughs> it makes him happy. So it's all these pathetic, sad little things that, like, this is really not that great a day. But to Bosco, this poor little schlub, it's an amazing day. He goes to his favorite bar. There's a new pinball machine. He gets the high score. The bartender offers him a free beer. I mean, these are all, like, amazing to Bosco. He's so happy. Um, he bets on the Mets at the bar, and the Mets actually win that day. So he makes, like, 20 bucks so he can afford a slice of pizza. <laughs> this is my favorite, the last page. On his way home, he's like, wow, it's a fire. This building's on fire. And this woman is bereft. She's like, it's awful. A fire broke out in that new disco. Um, The exits are stuck. It's the worst disaster ever. And it, it, the sad thing is, it's a, it was a private party. The most famous celebrities were inside. All the most fabulous people. Rock stars, models. Fashion designers, photographers, movie stars, gossip columnists, press agents, all trapped, burning to death in horrible agony. <laughs> and Bosco just walks away like, that doesn't sound that bad to me. And uh, he finishes it off with, yeah, I guess today has been a perfect day. That's uh, one of my favorite Boscos ever. Here's a little thing, uh, a little parody of Personal Ads. Basically an excuse for J.D. King to draw these, draw these amazingly. Look at this stuff. This is pretty highbrow, if you ask me. It's just like incredibly stylized design work here. And they're just like really pathetic personal ads. But uh, he gets to draw these great uh, illustrations. This is interesting. It's uh, one of the personal ads is a guy named Pete Sack. And it's a total parody of Peter Bag. <clears throat> he has a comic called Cool Junk instead of Neat Stuff. And uh, 
talking about how he loves plot, mad, drag car cartoons, and Dennis the Menace. And uh, he's got all this stuff. It's like very Peter Baggy, smoking a candy cigarette or chewing on a candy cigarette. And we will see this soon. So don't forget this little Pete Sack character. Here's some ads. And that's it for twist number one. That's some nice stuff. Okay, twist number two. That's just, that's some pretty great design here. That's just really nice stuff. Drew Friedman again. Once again, I'm pretty sure I saw this before I read Twist somewhere. But whatever. It's Drew Friedman at his best. So, uh, one of his movie parodies. Contents page. This is probably uh, a big reason for the how great these are. Contributing editor, Glenn Bray. Glenn Bray has got like one of the most amazing collections of original art. And just so much cartooning stuff. That guy's been collecting shit since the early 70s. He probably picked it all up for a song. He's got original Basil Wolverton's just amazing stuff. Glenn Bray is like a, a Di Medici for cartoonists. We have another episode of Freddie Brown the Squirt by, uh, this time it's just Dan Klaus. More Todd is not writing. This is some pretty funny stuff. Um, really uh, rips into the hippies. I guess Freddie Brown kind of takes place in the late 60s. There's still the 50s attitudes of his father. He hates the hippies. And um, <clears throat> just some pretty, this is really funny stuff. You could tell that, like, yeah, this is more Dan Klaus than more Todd. <clears throat> some good stuff there. Okay, we have a nice Richard Sala one pager. This is back when Richard Sala was actually interesting and good. And uh, just this random dude realizes, you know, he, st he loves Fantastic Film Man Monsters magazine. And uh, it had a strange effect on him. And uh, everything in his life suddenly seemed dull and empty. So he started like going to movie theaters, preying on unlucky patrons. He'd lived under the seats of Phantom striking without warning. And he dared to hope that one day he would receive that highest honor of being on the cover of Fantastic Film Man Mo Monsters. So even though he was in a mummy, or a werewolf. He uh, did his best to become a monster. This one is very, uh, this is a JD King that fully is like just style. It's all style, <laughs> there's no content. Nothing's really happening here except for some nice design work. Some very hip design. He's the origin of Bosco. We see Bosco as a young kid which I don't think we've ever seen before. His parents are having a big party. Everyone's over. His mom's saying, go to bed. But, you know, Bosco doesn't listen. He's still watching. And then his uncle, Ned, shows up. And Uncle Ned is kind of a huge asshole, but he's also kind of the life of the party. So some people at the party are saying, like, what a creep. Get him out of here. Some people are saying, I think he's a riot. So he's just this like weird guy. He's like throwing food around. People are threatening to beat him up. He's just like, lighten up, dude. It's a party. And uh, things really get bad where he's throwing bottles. Everyone's going to beat the shit out of him. And uh, Bosco says, I want to be just like Uncle Ned when I grow up. So that's his role model. And as we see, Bosco will become more like him. Here's one of those reprints. Um, this guy, I got I can't even tell by his signature. Let me look back. I think he's a Frenchman. I've never heard of him. Fugazze, F-O-U-G-A-S-S-E. -S -S -E. This is some nice, like, early, I would say 30s cartoony. And um, like something that would be in like the New Yorker or something. What is that? This is weird. It's just a hundred words by Jenny Holzer. It's just this like kind of little 
prose poem about guns. A very pro-gun thing. This is really nice. Because Dennis Kitchen, great underground cartoonist, but became a publisher. And he stopped drawing. Because he had a big publishing concern to deal with. Um, the one that publishes comic. Kitchen Sing Press. So... <clears throat> This is just him talking about being a publisher, starting out in the boonies when he was a rural publisher, and uh, all the things he has to deal with, dealing with all these different personalities. It's script by Dave Schreiner, though, and he worked with Dennis Kitchen for years, so he's kind of making fun of Dennis Kitchen. And Dennis Kitchen is drawing it. And, uh, yeah, getting to see any, any Dennis Kitchen artwork is great. Because he rarely drew <clears throat> after like 1970-something. Here's another Josh uh, Gosfield. This is the center spread. So he, ch this, uh, this, this is going to be an issue number two and three. Very similar type strips where, well, they're not really strips. They're just like random jokes. Like this is about Trotsky. But they're very like just like inane and dada. Like, uh, Leon Trotsky's identical twin moved to New York City and became a beatnik poet. And, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody shows up, who's got nothing to do with Trotsky. He's just filling up space. So it's got this very silly sense of humor. It's kind of fun. Kind of good. This guy can't draw very well, but I think he's pretty good for just silly, you know, humor. It kind of works. So it's just all these non-sequitur kind of... Silly, funny jokes. It's pretty good, though. So here's another example of, like, them just getting some public domain stuff. Cheap, awesome shit. But, you know, at this time, not many people knew about Boris Archibashev. He was this great uh, artist in the 30s, 40s, did a lot of Time covers. Time magazine, he did all these great painted covers. But during the war, he did lots of propaganda. And this is commercial work he did which is commercial slash propaganda. It was for the Wickwire Spencer Steel Company. So this com company wanted to show how everything they made was helping the war effort. So we see here, like, all these, just all kinds of metal things, pots, pans, bike pumps are raining down on Hitler and Hirohito. And, um, or is that Tojo? I always mix them up. I think it's Hirohito. And, um... Steel Wire Warrior. There's this, uh, you know, the the steel wire would help the Allies fight the Axis. Wire Cloth Wallop. This is amazing art. Boris Archibashev. Almost like Basil Wolverton. Like, nobody drew like this guy. Springs to Hell. These springs are sending Hitler and Hirohito, Hirohito down to hell. Screening the Axis. All these Nazis are falling into this metal screen and their guns are coming out. This very cute character <laughs> made of wire mesh. Wire with a kick. This wire dude is kicking Hitler. I like how Hitler is making a swastika, his body form. It was a great shit. I mean, other than Raw, you didn't really see this stuff, even though I'm pretty sure this was free. I'm pretty sure this was in the public domain. But most editors didn't have the knowledge to put this in their comic. They could have for free, too. So here's some other stuff. Here, uh, apparently, has nothing to do with uh, the wire company, because this is about eggs, I imagine, for the troops, you know? Yeah, chicken farmers are helping the war for two by making eggs. To send to the troops. This guy, David Coulson, um, I haven't seen him before, but these are kind of like, I don't know, just this could be a mad magazine, but it's like a mad magazine for degenerates and juvenile delinquents. It's basically advice to teenagers like, hey, here's all these nasty things you can do, all these pranks you can pull. It's not that great. It's whatever. It's like something in mad. Okay. Sorry, these pages are sticky. We got another J.D. King one-pager. Once again, making fun of hippies. This comic really seems to really not like hippies. 
And uh, I guess it's the goofy gag. I love this page, though. This is the only appearance of Kaz and Twist. And this is like a very artsy Kaz. Like, this is kind of something that could be in a museum wall. The exquisite corpse returns to its coffin. And, uh, yeah, it's just a one-page art piece before Kaz became the underworld gag artist. So this is interesting. So that little parody that J.D. King did in the personal ads where he made a Pete Sack which is a parody of Peter Bag. So Peter Bag draws a comic, a two-page comic, as Pete Sack, taking that parody and then making a parody of that. And this, I just love this kind of early Pete Bag. You know, Pete Bag doesn't draw like this anymore. Like just that gonzo and far out. And it's basically like parodying himself. Like he's a cynical guy who hates all the modern shit in the world. Yeah, look at that, how abstract that is. That's just crazy. And, uh, yeah, this is some great art. I mean, I love Peter Beck's stuff, all of it. But I still wish he had time to draw like this every now and then, like this expressive, crazy, over-the-top cartooniness. I mean, look at that. It's just... He doesn't do that anymore. And this last panel, I didn't even know what's happening. Like, he's mad. He's basically yelling at the reader. But I can't even recognize how that is that. That is just this crazy abstract imagery. <laughs> I like it, though. I mean, I, I love it. This is, man, I miss Peter Begg. How he used to draw. That is very serious. And he does biographies of uh, famous literary characters. Here's the twist list again. And, um, yeah, kind of forgettable, kind of silly. And then we get some ads. And, uh, yeah, that's it for that issue. So, unfortunately, this is the last issue. I wish Twist went on and on. Because even though they didn't have much of a budget, with the little budget they had, they did a damn good job. Here's J.D. King doing another retro hip cat type thing for Twist. Um, very well designed contents page once again. I mean, J.D. King, that's his thing. He's a designer. Now, this is amazing. And, you know, it's a reprint from Esquire magazine, 1961. It's The Return of a Christmas Carol, written by Harvey Kurtzman. And drawn by David Levine, the famous cartoonist. I don't know if these guys collaborated ever again. Um, it's kind of tiny, unfortunately. You know, Esquire Magazine was a big magazine. And they had to shrink it down. So it's a little... I wish it was a little bigger. But I mean, this is some great art. And it's Harvey Kurtzman kind of in his prime. This is, I believe, is pre Lanny Fanny. And he's doing a parody of The Christmas Carol, but Ebenezer Scrooge owns a television station. And, you know, he's a soulless, you know, money-grubbing fuck. And his TV station shows the worst kind of content, like most TV stations did. So his, um, Marlo, I'm sorry, Marley, just like in Christmas Carol, you know, his partner who died, he sends these three ghosts. The Ghosts of Christmas Past, Present, and Future. And it's pretty much just a typical thing you've seen many times before. The retread of Christmas Carol. But with all that, like, Harvey Kurtzman satire. Definitely of the time. Really savaging TV. But also, like, doing some great character stuff with Scrooge. Showing his past. How shallow he is. And, you know. Yeah, I love this cartoon. I wish I had some more David Levine stuff. And then on Christmas morning, when he wants to make everything right, it definitely shows this Harvey Christmas satiric bent, where he's like, from now on, I'm just going to show public service announcements and things that enrich humankind. And, um, you know, I'm going to make television broadcasting enriching to everyone. And of course... He lost all his viewers and lost loses the station. 
because Americans don't want to see that shit. And, uh, yeah, some good classic Harvey Kurtzman that probably no one's ever seen, even though it's a reprint. And, uh, you know, it's not like you'd own that issue of Esquire. Who, who has that? Once again, they got R. Crumb to be in the issue, but it kind of looks like they just asked R. Crumb to send him a page from his sketchbooks. This looks like a... I mean, R. Crumb's sketchbooks are pretty damn good, but it's not like... I'm pretty sure R. Crumb didn't draw this just for twists. They were just like, hey, we want you in the magazine. Do you have anything lying around? And he sent this. It's not very good for R. Crumb. I mean, the art's beautiful, but... I don't know, it's just kind of a non sequitur. And here we have another Freddie Brown the Squirt and uh, art and story by Dan Klaus. And uh, another really funny episode. And uh, yeah, Freddie Brown give, tries to seduce his babysitter, puts Spanish fly and booze in a drink <laughs> and makes her all horny. So when the father comes home, she attacks him. And then the father of the babysitter who's been wondering why she's late shows up and beats the shit out of him. It's pretty nutty. I wish there was more Freddie Brown the Squirts. I kind of like it, though. He's like Dennis the Menace times 50. Another great Richard Sala. Back when Richard Sala was like the master of like quirky, weird, paranoid comics. And um, this one is like really good it really captures this nightmarish thing where this guy's having a birthday party and everything goes wrong like just all these little things happen like someone spills wine in the carpet his dog takes a sudden dislike to his boss and bites him and has to be tied up fights break out bats fly in and attack the people it was way over the top and um they hired, oh, uh, the evening's entertainment was provided by people from work. They put on a puppet show that seemed to me to be a thinly veiled account of my life, complete with cruel innuendos and ludicrous symbolism. So he has to watch this pop puppet show where his co-workers are just mocking him. They uh, hire a hypnotist for entertainment, and he performs a party trick on his wife, and then he later sees them leaving together. It's just the worst night ever. It's like a total nightmare. And um, then his therapist shows up. And he just mentioned that he's going to a party in his session. And totally unprofessionally, the therapist shows up. And he's drunk and he's wearing a bad toupee. And then he starts regaling everyone. Totally breaking the Hippocratic Oath. Telling everyone about his secrets that he uh, has revealed to him during therapy sessions so he runs out of there the dog attacks him jumps over the fence lands in quicksand and as he's sinking down to his death the last thing i heard was the sound of music and laughter coming from my house it's like so nightmarish like in the true sense of a nightmare like i've had nightmares like that where like oh my god here's a little bosco one pager just a Goofy little gag. Um, this guy I've never heard of before. Mostrum. A. Mostrum. And uh, he's got that definitely like 80s, whatever, indie style kind of ugly art. And uh, it's basically just making fun of beatnik poets. This beatnik poet is making up all these poems and they're pretty stupid and pretentious. But uh, it's kind of funny, the poems, you know. Here's another Josh Gosfield center spread. This time doing David Crock, the David Crockett story. Once again, just silly as hell. Davy's great grandson, Elvis Rocket. Variations of the classic fashion statement, the Davy Crockett hat. There's the totem pole, rabbit ears. The Hasidim. Davy Crockett hat with the raccoon tails are on each side of the face like a Hasidim. Yeah, this is uh, some fun, silly humor. I kind of like this guy. I wish I, I had more of Josh Gosfield's stuff. 
once again, they're on the cheap here. So they reprint this comic from a, a 1962 issue of Evergreen. And this is R.O. Bleckman, the classic great cartoonist. It's just this little kind of typical thing you've seen before, Cold the Cold War. So these two guys are on either side of the fence. You know, it's Germany, looks like. And they start having a snowball fight. They're like, yeah, I want to have fun. We're bored. But then the authorities see them and they take them both away at gunpoint for daring to have fun. Here we go again. Once again, making fun of beatniks. J.D. King has a, a longer story. And it's basically just this comic with his great design work. That's just making fun of beatniks. Um, but it has some like interesting character stuff showing you the background of all these beatnik characters where they're from. Not that great, but I do like J.D. King's art. It's so unique. Yeah, it's pretty long for J.D. King. Still going on. Yeah. I can tell you more about this, but really all it is is like making fun of beatniks. And here's the twist list for this issue. And, uh, yeah, they're just so random. It's a lot link. And then the Evolution Revolution from Lancelot Link. Bridget Bardot. You know, whatever. Here's some ads. And that's it for Twist, unfortunately. Only lasted three issues. I wish it lasted longer. Number three, number two, and number one. So I, I, I found these many times in quarter bins. I bought them off the stands, but over the years, nobody cares about this comic. It died at Quick death, nobody cared. But I think it's one of the better comic anthologies of the 80s. Even though they didn't have much of a budget. Uh, just the aesthetic behind it. It was a cohesive uh, anthology with an editorial point of view. And a lot of great stuff. And I um, hope you like this. And I uh, hope you can find Twist. I bet you will for cheap. You should get them. There's some really nice stuff in here, as you saw. So thanks for watching, and have a good night.